Welcome and thank you for attending this session on fully autonomous storage and memory hierarchies. My name is Irfan Ahmed and I am the CEO and founder of Magnition. Magnition is a company focused on providing technology and algorithms for the future of storage and memory systems, in particular for fully automated and fully autonomous storage systems. Prior to this, I was a founder of Cloud Physics, which has recently been acquired by Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And I used to work before that at VMware as a tech lead in the operating systems and distributed resource scheduling teams where we brought to market lights out data center management products, including load balancing, automatic data movement, and real-time IO scheduling product. The key question to start with is, do the storage and memory industries need fully autonomous systems? Now, obviously, what's been happening in the last few years in the use of AI, machine learning, and wide-scale data analytics is a trend towards automating tasks for consumers. Today, we have self-driving autopilot and autonomous systems that are being prototyped and tested on California roads. This is the state of the art when it comes to autonomous systems in cars. However, enterprise storage customers and data center operators enjoy not the same level of sophistication. In fact, we're quite far from being able to build fully autonomous data centers. The challenging machine learning problems associated with fully autonomous data centers are actually quite unique and in some cases much more challenging than what is found in other domains. But we can change how the customers operating these products manage these systems and make a significant difference in the operational costs and efficiencies. It is fairly well known that storage memories, caches, are very complex stateful resources and the combination of increasingly dynamic workloads and the stateful nature of the resource itself doesn't easily lend to rapid changes in resource allocation policies because data movement is involved, warm up times are required, et cetera. And of course, this makes automation actually quite a difficult task and it's not for the lack of trying. Researchers have been trying to implement autopilot systems for storage for several decades uh, with limited results. Remarkably, both the automotive industry and the computer industry have been trying to achieve autonomous operations for about the same length of time. So on the right-hand side, you'll see some visualizations for LIDAR and LIDAR-based object detection while vehicles are in motion in multiple directions, as well as static obstacles mapped to those locations using hints from GPS um, locations on maps and so on. On the left, we see quite dynamic behavior from storage workloads and storage systems. You see some visualizations for access patterns for disk workloads taken from real production customers in the background. Um, and then you'll see also on the left, large chunks of time uh, included in the leftmost visualization of heat maps of varying levels of activity, varying levels of reuse distance, uh, cacheability, working sets, and so on. So they tend to be quite, quite dynamic with a lot of variance that you can see uh, in some of the colors. Now, if we visualize these in just the right way, when we apply the right AI ML tools, we can actually become quite predictive. And that's where the most recent research in the field has been taking us. So if we look at the plot that is constantly moving on the left, that's another specific example. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But this one is looking at the highest, most expensive tiers in a storage system, which are the tier zero caches. This particular case is a customer workload that exhibits quite a dramatic shift in the working set of the workload over a very short period of time. So short, it would require quite a dynamic algorithm to maintain SLOs, and to date, those algorithms have not been possible. Now, to get there, we need to build autonomous systems that are self-aware, perform real-time modeling, and adaptive mitigations. The equivalent of this in self-driving cars would be pedestrians crossing the road, um, sudden unexpected traffic, or a highway undergoing construction, and now the car has to figure out some evasion strategy. So, whereas in the automotive domain, those models are getting mature. In the world of storage and memory resource management, we're just now starting to get uh, those abilities in our tool belt. With this background, let's jump in and talk about the current state of the art, which is manually managed storage and memories. Well, as you're seeing in the industry, that's starting to become infeasible. So on the one hand, it is not uncommon for a modern application to undergo actual code changes hourly especially in microservice-oriented architectures where applications are spread out over large networks. Similarly, storage systems um, and access patterns that they uh, have to deal with and behaviors in workloads that they have to deal with change by the minute. And the frequency, intensity, variance, and volatility is starting to increase. 
On the other hand, thankfully, we have more hardware variety than ever to be able to handle these variations. Unfortunately, along with those additional tiers of memory and storage naturally comes complexity. So we are going through a period when hardware complexity is actually making it more challenging. And at this point in time, it is infeasible to successfully manage storage and memory allocations manually and to do so efficiently. So the net result is we are increasingly vulnerable to seemingly insurmountable challenges, technical challenges, including issues like thrashing, interference, unpredictable availability, and so on. Now these limit, from a business point of view, uh, what the efficiencies and um, cost reductions can be had. And technically, these are today leading to over-provisioning, which results in high cost. And obviously, there's a huge lack of control over performance, leading to much higher risk. So the only way out of this impasse that we are in at this certain juncture in time that we find ourselves in is to rethink our approach as an industry. We, I believe, will need to build and bring to market fully autonomous storage and fully autonomous memory hierarchies. And we will need to build an ecosystem of technology suppliers and standards to be able to accomplish this. So that's really my goal in this conference talk, to establish the business case and need associated with this uh, in our industry. Now, in the world of storage, we can learn from other domains and understand and try to build a taxonomy of the models and the types of systems and characteristics that have to be learned in an autonomous memory hierarchy. Now, I personally categorize these into two kinds of very high level, I'd say 10,000 foot level domains. First is a certain class of models that have to do with self-awareness. And, and then the other class is environmental awareness. Now, of course, we can compare and contrast with the self-driving cars in the automotive industry. So here, a self-awareness example is how a car accelerates. And remarkably, that's not a static notion. It's actually very dynamic. So as a car gets older or as it goes undergoes different stresses and different conditions, the acceleration is variable. So the model between an input and the output is actually contingent on many other factors. So a car should be self-aware of its dynamic ability to accelerate as a model. Braking has a similar characteristic, steering, um, and um, other types of control conditions. Even battery discharge is quite dependent and requires uh, predictive models. Now, environmental awareness in, for in the automotive industry would include GPS, maps, um, the ability to detect and understand static obstacles versus dynamic obstacles. You know, the ability to, um, to look at the terrain, look at the distances and the relative object velocities, uh, and map those to what's already known about the environment. So applying this to the world of autonomous data infrastructure, we can also do a self-awareness versus environmental awareness categorization. For example, with self-awareness, we have to be able to understand the tiers of memories disk, flash, et cetera, that exist in the hardware of the system. Um, I think of this like brakes and the acceleration capabilities. We have caches that provide tremendous acceleration with different types of memories uh, with different capabilities from read asymmetry, statefulness, persistence, throughput limits. So the data paths in our system that govern latencies, for example, uh, they may or may not have redundancies. These are all the types of things that go towards self-awareness uh, in, in the storage domain. Now, of course, there are environmental awareness concerns as well. So in the case of storage and memories, workloads are extremely dynamic. They change possibly at the microsecond scale. So these exceedingly dynamic systems um, and, and uh, the environmental components of these systems are such that I believe these are much more dynamic per unit of time than, for example, a self-driving vehicle. To be able to do QoS constraints and dealing with congestion and other factors is quite challenging. So other environmental issues is cost being dynamic. And you know, we know from cloud workloads and, and cloud economics that uh, cost may not be static and uh, interesting optimizations may be achieved uh, as a result of this. So all of this goes towards environmental awareness. So this allows us to now start to build a bit of a vocabulary around what are the underlying models, how, to, how we might go about creating those, and uh, we will get into it in a moment. But we can start to build an appreciation for how such models need to be built in real time for memories and storage, and that they need to adapt. They need to be self-aware and adapt so that at the end of the day, storage and memory systems are fully autonomous. So here's 
some background to be able to understand autonomous systems. Typically, autonomous systems will operate in some sort of an OODA loop. The idea of these OODA loops goes back to Colonel John Boyd of the US Air Force, uh, who was a very famous fighter pilot. And he developed these theories and, and um, emphasized that a faster rhythm from observations to orientations to decisions to actions um, is a significant advantage in systems of many different types. So as a result, um, a lot of autonomous systems run one or often many more than one OODA loops. So observations come from instrumentation. Uh, and being able to record that instrumentation to, and to make sense of it. Orientation has to do with being able to model the bits and bytes of data that are coming from the sensors uh, and um, put them in context and adjust the models about how the world is behaving and how those systems are behaving under various types of stresses and loads. And then to convert that into some decision that in, indicates an expectation of the ability to adjust um, the behavior and the course of events in the future well, that decision has to take many things into account, obviously cost-benefit analysis, confidence in the accuracy of the models and stability periods uh, um, for when the system predicts that the next phase transition might happen and so on. Now, finally, an action has to be taken and that connects to the actuation capability to make a change in the system. So this is fairly fundamental high level understanding of how autonomous system might behave. So, so I thought maybe we could zoom in and and uh, talk at a high level architecture of a fully autonomous memory hierarchy. So we have this central OODA loop fundamental to any autonomous system. We have our legacy applications or microservices or container-based Kubernetes, or maybe some orchestrated applications that are distributed and they're running against storage system, which itself is, uh, is complex and multi-tier and multi-layer. Could be a cloud storage system, could be a database, a digital engine, a single SSD, could be a cache. More often than not, it's some combination of these. So the first thing is from the left to right, we have instrumentation. So that crosses over between observe and orient. For example, in the case of magnetics technology, that instrumentation could be at the device or the operating system, an event bus or an RPC message level. In the case of low level devices, think of it as an IO or memory access pattern that we are able to instrument in a very lightweight manner. Obviously we cannot take every single memory request and instrument it, but most recent research in this area, including ours, has opened up uh, a new set of tools, including um, very careful sampling strategies. So we first worked on instrumentation in our product so that we can at extremely low cost maintain ongoing observation. Now, when we talk about orientation, this is always gonna be about modeling. So how, how do we fit those specific measured vectors of performance availability and, and translate them into models we have already learned? And furthermore, update those models from the new knowledge that is being gained through the information arriving. Now, once we have this orientation, we can enter uh, the predict phase, which is where we use these models and the real-time observations uh, and create a series of what-ifs from which we decide what decision to uh, make to improve the situation or to correct some imbalance that might be happening or to bring the system back into some compliance with qualitative service targets. So in this step, obviously we have very specific algorithms uh, needing to be implemented, including cost benefit analysis, stability analysis, um, and, um, and, and so on. So now, once we have that done, the decisions that are being selected in, obviously they need a set of actuators in the storage and memory hierarchy to actually make the changes in the parameters. Now, these parameters typically already exist in code in these systems, uh, but, as we know as engineers, uh, these parameters um, are in there because oftentimes the engineers working on these products, they are aware that there is a need and that um, you know, best of settings for any one of these parameters uh, is dependent upon too many conditions to just, um, to just guess at it. The difference is that today we tune these parameters in the lab before every major release, but they're not really dynamically tunable today. So what we want to do is to move towards being able to have a larger number of actuators that could influence the different behaviors of our systems and make them available, expose them to these new autonomous controllers. Now, of course, there's a OODA loop, so any decisions will affect future observations and any uh, future runs through the cycle will ensure that the system can continuously enforce these targets, these SLAs, and continue to optimize and continue to turn these knobs to hit um, at all times these desired outcomes at the lowest possible cost. Now, 
for this sort of a loop operating at such high throughput as would be required in a memory hierarchy or a storage system, it has to be exceedingly efficient. And that's really bad. What are the types of use cases that we could offer if we had fully autonomous QoS? So I've picked just two, and I'll go through them. And, and again, I'm focusing here on performance autonomy use cases uh, because of the limitation of time and my particular expertise. So the first one I want to talk about is autonomous uh, SLAs, which in many ways uh, are represented by the holy grail in the system, which is latency guarantees. Um, so the question is, could you take a storage system and dial in a certain number of milliseconds, let's say, of a performance guarantee at a very high percentile? If you could do that, what could be built with it? Well, several core value propositions exist around this capability of a user being able to dial in a certain latency or throughput target with a dollar budget and have an autonomous system auto-allocate the right amount of capacity throughout the platform, throughout the tiers to hit those SLAs. Now, if we had such a system, we could set and forget it and achieve lower overall risk of service disruptions and revenue disruptions. Such features would also allow higher margins in product because the business can do more consolidation with a smaller bomb or sharing of resources uh, while still being guaranteed that business critical functions achieve the service latencies that have been specified. So overall, this really boils down to achieving lower OPEX and lower risk profiles by dialing in the desired policies and the system, making sure that those are achieved. Or if they cannot be achieved, uh, then providing feedback to the operator that uh, those uh, requests for quality of service are not feasible within budget. Another really interesting use case is having a system accommodated from a completely different angle, which is autonomously optimize the cost or, or performance, um, whichever is a primary driver of business objective function. So instead of thinking of it as a QoS problem, we can, for other workload types, we can think of it as a pure cost optimization challenge. So here, using real-time workload modeling and resource allocation procedures, uh, we're able to dynamically adjust resources and provide isolation among different clients uh, and users and uh, achieve completely autonomous right-sizing dynamically for all the tenants of that system. Now, if we are able to achieve this, then the value propositions again are fascinating. We could achieve provably optimal lowest cost of ownership or whatever the workload that the customer throws at the system, the workload could be something we've never seen in the lab as part of our performance tests, but a fully autonomous system is able to navigate and figure out exactly how to drive the TCO down to the lowest possible level. And we could use this system to eliminate noisy neighbor problems, which is again a huge improvement in OPEX for our infrastructure teams. Now, finally, we can use the uh, operations and predictive planning use cases here so that a uh, fully autonomous system can plan itself on how much further ahead it needs to allocate more resources, buy more hardware, um, lease more hardware from the cloud, uh, or plan to do warm-ups and uh, many other technical uh, situations like this. So having seen the technical use cases, the value propositions and a high level vision of autonomous memory hierarchies, we can now look at some of the technical uh, underpinnings of how this could be accomplished. Now, again, I'm focused on the performance autonomy. What we see here is a very interesting, dynamic, constantly changing pattern. So um, just to give you a little introduction to what's happening here on the x-axis, we have a model of the resource allocation for a particular workload. So I think of this as um, the tier zero memory, which is allocated in gigabytes for this workload. Now the y-axis represents um, the performance. Um, the performance in this case is, is uh, plotted as a miss ratio, so lower is better. And of course we can plot latency directly from that as well, but for this visualization, uh, we plotted miss ratios. Now the curve that you see that relates the performance of the system that on the y-axis and the cost being allocated for to achieve that performance on the x-axis. Now the curve that you see that's constantly transforming, it actually represents the performance prediction of that particular application. If we were to, at any given moment in time, give it more or less of that tier zero memory. So this is behaving quite um, radically, right? So you would think that an application would have lower latency, which is good, uh, the more money you're willing to spend on or buying memory for it. And that's generally the case, but in this workflow, there is a burst of activity that happens over the course of a very short period of time minutes where the workload all of a sudden needs a lot more memory than it did just to be able to hit its 
uh, normal target of, of uh, performance. So here, if we draw the latency target as um, a horizontal line, what we see is that the curve that constantly shifts ends up uh, having the intersection with that latency target move quite a bit to the right. So in other words, the runtime requirements associated with being able to hit that latency target increase during that burst. As you can imagine, a burst carries with it a much larger working set. Let's say for a database, many more roles are being needed uh, to be able to process transactions that are being requested. So that generally will increase the working set. So in this real world customer example, what we see is that the nature of the, of the working set is quite variable and uh, many times much higher amounts of memory is needed to be able to hit those targets and other times less memory is quite good enough. So the first notice that this plot is quite dynamic as I mentioned and to be able to have fully autonomous systems we need to be able to have this model available in real time. Now the availability of that model today uh, is up until today has been quite difficult and not in real time and therefore systems haven't typically been built uh, to be able to exploit a knowledge law of this nature because that knowledge was quite hard to come by. So uh, with magnetic technology, we're able to, for example, take a continuously. So this curve, which you see here, is uh, similar in its nature to the previous, although for a different customer workload. Uh, but here, I've just frozen it in time so we can study it. So if any given instance in time, if this was the predicted model of the performance of the system, then what we know is, of course, latency gets lower the more money you're willing to spend, the more resources you're willing to give to this particular application. That makes a lot of sense. But these models, uh, are not just linear. They don't just, uh, they have these very interesting behaviors that have to be modeled. Otherwise, uh, the system would end up making a lot of mistakes. So here in this example, if we we're able to have this underlying hidden capability in our fully autonomous system, that it can predict the performance of its highest tier or the most important or most expensive tier of memories uh, and do so in real time, now we can actually, for the first time in the industry, build latency targets and we hold on to them completely autonomously, hands off the lights out model. So again, the y-axis is performance, lowers better because we're dealing with latency, x-axis is the total amount of resources given to this workload uh, dynamically. So it could be a much larger amount of memory and we're just deciding to give a particular workload a smaller chunk uh, of memory. And that's what we're showing here. So that curve just basically tells us, okay, how much some performance we would achieve at any given resource allocation. Now, if we're able to, in real time, draw this curve, this red curve here, we can actually convert that into a resource allocation decision for that workload completely dynamically and autonomously. That would result in achieving latency SLOs. So if we pin this workload at seven milliseconds of the 90th, 95th percentile, even as the workload evolves and it working, its working set increases, we'll be able to follow along and keep up with it. So this is a very powerful capability that has just now become feasible and is one of the key suppliers into assembling a fully autonomous storage system of the future. Now, um, one particular tier's memory allocation is not good enough, obviously. So the previous example was a very powerful one, but a simple one. In fact, many tiers are involved. So here, without going into the details, I hint at how a fully autonomous system could use these models to construct the exact allocation of resources in various tiers to be able to hit the um, desired uh, objectives. So hopefully, um, we can come together as an industry and build consensus around these concepts. It's some examples I've given it barely touch the surface uh, so that we can start to build a system that in the end game is able to finally deliver completely lights out self-managing policy-driven systems um, to the world of storage and memory hierarchies and the database industries and, and so on. If we are able to achieve that, we'll finally be able to throw all of these control knobs um, that we have today and finally manage our data centers uh, in a way where we can throw away the steering wheel uh, um, and um, have the data center in a self-aware manner follow the policies that we've provided and uh, and finally allow our customers um, the ability to truly enjoy experience uh, for their enterprise products and applications and systems that they are starting to get used to with their consumer product. So I look forward to collaborations across the industry around this and please get in touch and look forward to fruitful conversations. Thank you very much.